welcome, and thanks for joining Agritecture's Travel Free Digital Conference Series. My name is David Caesar, the lead agronomist at Agritecture Consulting. Joining me today is Cameron Scadding, the director of Source Certain International. Cameron, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks very much, David. Awesome. Um, so just really briefly, you guys are located in Australia. How are things going down there? Yeah, so I'm actually on the West Coast, so I, I don't think I could be any further away from where you guys are there. Um, so um, isolated Perth on the West Coast. Um, yeah, it's a tough time, isn't it? It's, um, I mean, Australia, I, I, I've been pretty proud of the way we've handled it. We've, we've been pretty aggressive with the lockdown process. Um, I think at times maybe we could have gone earlier, but generally speaking, we've, we've been really proactive. And, and so I look out at other parts of the world, including where you guys are, and I'm kind of grateful, to be honest, of, of where we live. And then I'm also just grateful for generally the, the family's all healthy. You know, we're all at home together. Um, and there are worse places to live, David, than sunny Perth, right on the west coast of Australia. Yeah, I'm sure I've never been had the been fortunate enough to visit Australia, but I hope to someday. Um, so, tell us about Sourcer International. I had never heard of it, but I know you have some slides prepared. So, if you could just share with the, our audience about your company and and the work that you guys are doing. Yeah, th thanks very much, David, and and hi everyone. Um, I I think I actually met. I think I met Henry at an event here in Australia a, a, a couple of years ago now. I think it was an ag tech event. Um, I was actually on a panel and we've sort of stayed connected since. And, and I really appreciate the opportunity um, to share a little bit about what we do and, and who Source Certain is. Uh, this is going to be a, a 10 minute um, presentation near about. So I'm going to cram a lot of information in and, and I'll just say that I'm more than happy to come back and talk to any of the points as we go. What I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and talk a bit about um, the relationship that consumers have um, with supply chain um, and the food they eat, but not just the food, the products they, they, they purchase. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about this whole notion of trust and consumer trust and, and what's become a really messy area around traceability, authenticity, provenance and transparency. And what we're seeing is a, you know, an almost um, amorphous use of use of these terms, and source certain is ultimately a, a forensic provenance business. And so, there are a couple of things I'm trying to achieve. One of them is I'm trying to make sure people know what the key functions are inside the supply chain, um, and make sure that we're actually solving problems. Now, I, I wouldn't describe source certain as a typical ag tech, but um, we definitely work across the agri food supply chain, and and I, I speak at two to three of these events a year. So um, I, I think we've got a bit to offer and, and I'm keen to talk to kind of some of the challenges that, that ag tech do as well, maybe, maybe during the, the question time. Um, I always like to start um, with a simple slide that um, in, encapsulates, if you like, um, what we're about. And, and, you know, we jump from being a tech provider to looking at it purely from a consumer perspective and, I use this particular slide in pretty much every presentation I give. Um, I think it provides a pretty handy summary um, of some of the challenges that consumers face um, in terms of the terms that are used um, inside the consumer marketplace, but also the risk you know, of substitution and, and dodgy stuff. I, I can't even provide um, credit for this particular photo because um, I've stolen it off a social media platform um, but I think it summarises, you know, pretty clearly, you know, the, the challenges and, and the whole notion around what I, I and others and colleagues of mine refer to as information asymmetry in terms of consumers being faced with these types of terms and, you know, what do they mean? What do they mean to me? Um, what can be going on behind them? I'm paying, you know, enormous premiums for some of these claims. Am I getting what I pay for? Is it worth it? That these are really big challenges and it's not just about claims like this it's it's about local it's about um, ethically sourced it's it's about sustainability it's all of these things which which the consumer um, um, basically faces when they enter a supermarket and I'll show you a slide later that that summarizes that 
very briefly about me um, because I want to talk more about source certain, but um, I, I'm deeply passionate about agriculture. Um, I'm from a wheat and sheep um, property here in um, Western Australia. So the picture you can see is an aerial shot of the farm which I grew up on, um, which was sort of more than 10,000 acres of wheat and sheep. So have a deep connection um, to, the, to the farming um, community and, and agriculture. Um, but, but to be really honest, never wanted to be a farmer. Um, I, I wanted to catch bad guys, I guess. Um, and, and so left and um, did a whole heap of education around forensic investigation and forensic chemistry. So I'm a forensic practitioner by training. Um, so an investigator. Um, I've spent the bulk of my career inside complex um, investigations around supply chain. Um, and that's ranged from gold and diamonds through to, you know, over a decade of, of food fraud type work. Uh, now, more importantly, um, less about me, more about the business. So what about Source Certain? Um, so Source Certain, um, oh. So, you know what, you're, you might want to oh. just, it seems like the camera is not working, but if you just want to turn off your camera, oop. Oh, yeah, I can hear you, but my, um, the iPad one just disconnected. It's okay. You can keep going. Let's just keep going, and then um, we can put an image of you. Can you see the screen? Yeah, I can see the screen. Can you? I can. I can. Uh, well, but you can see it on your laptop, right? I can. I can. I can. Yeah, so it's the Providence. It says Providence. And it's got a fingerprint. Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, perfect. All right. So just keep going. Yep. Okay. We'll just keep going. Press on. Uh, yeah. So um, moving moving on from me to talking about the business um, and and importantly, source certain. Um, there is there is no doubt that that consumers care where their products have come from and how they've been produced. And ultimately, source certain is a forensic provenance business. We 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 work with real samples, um, and our technology, which is recognised globally. Um, and accepted kind of in legal jurisdictions um, right across um, the, the globe uh, underpins the claims that are made by verifying where they come from. And so uh, inside that, that forensic training or forensic research career that I've had, but also with, with one of my co-founders, John Watling, um, and colleagues, we've, we've managed to build a robust method um, which determines where stuff comes from. So in the context of, of food, um, that could be egg, uh, an egg, whether it's free range cage or barn, for example, um, we could take that egg um, back to its um, discrete granular point of origin uh, and, and to uh, moving into sort of diamonds, which, you know, obviously very topical back to the granular um, production site um, that they came out of the, the earth. So the pipe, for example, by which they were produced. And so that's at the core of, of our business. Um, it, it's not necessarily the forward facing part that most people see, but that's the key technology that underpins it. Um, it's about its first um, peer reviewed publication was about 40 years ago. Um, so it's very well tested. Um, and then what, what I've done and what we've done as a business is we've taken that key technology um, and built it into a whole series of forward looking, proactive supply chain integrity um, solutions. Jumping back um, to the marketplace, uh, there, is, there is little doubt um, that transparency uh, inside the supply chain and specifically inside the food chain is absolutely critical. Um, if it's not already here, um, it is definitely coming. Um, I would argue that it's a foundational um, requirement. Uh, consumers um, are, are shifting between expecting and demanding it. Um, depends on the type of product that we're talking about. Um, we advocate that stakeholders um, take control of this shift and, and kind of control who, who turns the light on. Um, it, it's really important that, that as you shift towards a place of more transparency, you understand um, some of the risks that are inside your supply chain. Um, and, and because of the, the highly industrialized um, supply chain or food chain in particular that we have, some of these risks have always been 
a little out of sight, out of mind. And so it's important that, that stakeholders um, do this. There's a really big question around how you mediate um, transparency. And so governments around the world have, have definitely made steps to regulating it. Um, and so, you know, you think back in time, whether it be country of origin labelling through to um, sort of more mandated traceability. So, from an, for example, Australia has always had a regulatory driven traceability requirement, um, but it leads to, and, and I don't think we have the answers to these questions yet, it leads to these questions, you know, what do we share? What don't we share? When do we share it? Um, and, and how do we share it? And, and some of that's driven by uh, consumers and, and information they want, but, but I would argue today that it's not necessarily clear what they want for particular products. And, and so, you know, generally speaking today, the challenge is how do brands and, and stakeholders inside the chain move to a place of more transparency because it's, it's necessary. Um, put it out there and, and, you know, I'll argue a bit about leadership um, in this space, put it out there and, and effectively build some of that trust um, in the bank, you know, for the business as they figure out exactly, you know, what that information needs to look like. Um, there's an intersect here um, between that consumer trust, um, transparency and, and social license. So whilst we always want to be looking at value creation or, or ways to create value inside value propositions for products inside the chain or, or, and protect them, um, there is some bigger stuff at play and, and, and this plays out reasonably regularly in the food chain um, whereby you have um, activities that are happening inside the chain which, which particular stakeholders and leaders within those are aware of, um, sometimes complicit, um, running that same out of sight, out of mind argument. Um, and what's at risk there is not necessarily that pure consumer trust thing, but a broader social license one and, and a broader freedom to operate. Um, I'll show you an example with the next slide, but, but just recently, you know, um, what we heard, which was not surprising to me, because I've worked in this space for over a decade, but we heard, you know, news come out about Nespresso's, um, uh, I think it was the the pod product they have and the fact that there were claims that there were, were um, unethical practices, slaves inside some of those chains. None of that's surprising to me, but those types of issues, if they materialise, which sometimes they do, um, put businesses at risk at a, at a whole and sometimes whole of industry um, at risk. Uh, a, a really good example of this, getting a little bit old now, but I really like the sequence that it presents. Um, Russell Hume Meats um, out of the UK failed an inspection on January 12, uh, changing use by dates um, on product. They were banned from selling meat um, on January 20 by the regulator. Um, they're a big supplier to, to restaurants like Jamie Oliver's, which is also no longer exist, I believe, or at least under heaps of pressure. Um, on February 5, the Liverpool site resumes. Um, on February 16, the media's re media reported a whistleblower claim of substitution. The claim was that it was not UK meat, even though that's what the claim was on the pack. Um, and on 50, February 19, the company ent entered administration. So what you can see here is, is, you know, is a pretty simple and clear pathway to walking off a cliff. And, and so what, what is really important here is that we reflect back on that conversation just two slides ago around transparency and the importance that someone has their eye on these issues. Um, it's a material risk to a business. Um, it's, it's, it's material to consumers. Um, and it's important that, that someone actually be doing something about it. It's not just um, business to business or, or stakeholders, it can be whole of industry. Um, this isn't the same sort of problem as what was highlighted on the previous slide, but it demonstrates that provenance matters and authenticity matters. So uh, last year, the Chinese suspended Canadian um, pork, which resulted in collateral damage to beef. Um, it, it, at the core of this, there was sort of a claim around a country of origin certificate, um, which demonstrated that it's really important that the integrity of these claims be able to be validated because um, what happened in this example was effectively the market access um, went away, the, the trade barriers came up um, and there was no uh, capacity to easily deal with the allegation that Maybe the certificate was fraudulent or maybe the product was actually substituted. Um, the reason why the barrier came up um, was because of 
uh, residues detected um, in one of those products and some um, some of the some questions around the, the the provenance or country of origin. What's important from our perspective here as a business is we've been operating this particular space for for nearly a decade, and, and so we've got a series of services already in place where our core objective is to be able to act in these types of examples. So what our technology can do in this example is the suspected piece of pork, which is claimed to have come from Canada and, and more, more granular than that, a particular place in Canada, we're able to, using our technology, verify those claims. Um, and probably more importantly is exclude them um, if they're not the case and, and effectively push back up the chain and say, no, that, that's actually not a Canadian piece of meat. So there's no reason for, for the access to be to be suspended or whatever the argument may be um, and, and effectively enable some of those businesses to get back to work. So what about consumers? And um, I don't think anybody really knows um, the answers that are often asked with respect to consumers, but, but you know, what I will say is the US through um, groups like the Centre for Food Integrity, I think are, are a long way in front of where some of the rest of the world are in terms of understanding and, and some of the trust transparency work that's come out of there is excellent. Uh, generally speaking though, in a simplistic way, you know, parents, consumers, they want to buy products that are healthy, in line with their expectation with respect to wellbeing and health. Um, but also they, they don't necessarily, you know, want to be, you know, buying just the cheapest, although that is a, an important consideration. They care about the environment. There's, there's lots and lots of different competing uh, thought processes that go into this. Um, but we do have a somewhat, when we talk about it from a presentation perspective, we do have a bit of a romantic view as to what consumers are doing and how they're actually behaving and, and the, the very active decisions that we believe they are making. Um, the reality, I would argue, is actually much different to that, and that's that price really matters. Um, they're under huge amounts of pressure because of other parts of their life, um, and, um, and they just need to get in and get out often, but they still do care about the, the well-being, of course, of their, their family, their health, and the claims that are made, and they also care about the impact that they're having on the environment. And so... Um, what we've got to be mindful of is that whilst they are willing to make these decisions, we've probably got to move to being a bit more clear about what these claims are. Which leads reasonably nicely into what the problem is and what the, one of the challenges is. You know, the marketplace can be really confusing. Um, we, we wonder why we're having a conversation around consumer trust when you see, you know, outrageous claims on water like gluten-free and silicon-rich and you know, I always, you know, when I present these at conferences, you know, I've, I've never, ever, ever considered that there would ever be a wheat protein in my water. Um, and, and we've got, you know, crazy situations like free range milk. This is an Australian example. You know, almost all of our milk is free range. Um, there's no reason for that to be on store, uh, uh, on, on label, except for the fact that someone's claiming is effectively paying or asking someone to pay more for that product. Um, which I just, I would argue is completely unethical and is, is, is largely there to confuse um, the consumer. I'm going to use, a, I'm going to talk a bit to a, a seafood example at the back end of the presentation. So I just wanted to show, you know, this is a, a snapshot of the claims that we're seeing um, inside just seafood, you know, and, and so you, like I said, you wonder, you know, why we're having this conversation about consumer trust. How do they know what all of these things mean? Um, and, and then we wonder why they're defaulting um, to just wanting to know where their food comes from. Um, and I, I would argue that's because, you know, we are really, we are really focused as consumers on, on that trust piece, which I think is largely a human to human interaction. And, and so connection really matters. And you'll see, a, you'll see a slide in a second which details that. So what matters? You know, safety is obviously really important. Quality is obviously really important. Um, and price is obviously materially critical. Uh, but, you know, what we're seeing is a transition. And I think, you know, the, I've seen some of the narrative coming out from the agriculture crew around local and, and the like. I think the story really matters too. And, and it's really important um, that that be a true story and not just be a marketing pitch. So the question is, is, you know, is this about connection? You know, is it, are, are we, are we rapidly trying to humanize um, our supply chain, which has become very industrialized. 
Um, now, we shouldn't take away the benefits or, or discount the benefits that that industrialised supply chain has delivered us, delivered us, which is, you know, pretty much any food that we want um, at pretty much any time of the year, certainly in wealthy Western countries like mine. Um, some countries still don't have enough food and, and there's, there's, you know, a whole other conversation to be had there. But, but you know, we are trying to humanise. And so what we're seeing is examples like this um, in terms of, you know, local um, showing pictures of the farmer. Um, what I will say is that during COVID-19 and, and, you know, the crisis or the challenge that we all face now is we're starting to see an amplification of some of these trends at a macro level. Um, I, I don't think we, I think we, we need to be careful not to join too many dots together because it's, an, it's a very unusual time, but we are seeing um, a demand for local um, part of that is because of the logistical tra challenges of moving stuff around. It, and so there's a practical answer to it. But I think there's also an amplification of, of some of that macro trend that we talked about around, around sourcing local and being connected to the farmer. So what are we talking about at a mag tech kind of level? You know, and where do we fit in, I guess, as a business? Um, you know, the first thing for me is, you know, transparency, traceability, authenticity and provenance are not all the same thing. Um, they are all discrete requirements. For example, transparency, I, I like to, to discuss as a commitment that a business makes and the most important step um, with respect to consumer trust, uh, I believe is the, the businesses and stakeholders making that commitment and actually starting to walk the talk around um, transparency. Traceability, you know, which uh, it, it's astonishing to me, the amount of um, dialogue that happens around traceability um, and how quickly that has happened over the last um, two to three years. Traceability is largely an output of a series of systems. Um, traceability itself is a really important um, management tool um, for the food chain. Um, and, it's a, and it's in a regulated way, um, a transparency measure too, um, but it's often not a solution to some of the problems which consumers are facing, which is that broader integrity piece. Um, which drives, which leads into kind of the authenticity and provenance piece. You know, the provenance is about where it's come from. Um, the authenticity, is it true? You know, can I trust those claims that are there? And, and so if you're building a broader supply chain integrity offering, it's not about any one of those. And, and certainly what we're seeing is, um, I guess, supply chain solution providers, um, blockchain being one of them, blockchain providers being one of them, that are advocating, you know, reasonably, you know, broad brush um, solutions that kind of manifest from a marketing perspective into a silver bullet. The reality is, is they just aren't that, you know, if there's a really strong need for collaboration across the chain, but also between um, technology service providers to, to genuinely tackle some of these challenges. Um, I, I think it's really important that one, firstly, that we acknowledge there's lots of solutions already out there, so there's no need to necessarily go and create them, um, but, it's, but it's a pretty noisy marketplace, and, and I'm sure that's something that, that the agritecture guys can advocate to as well. One of the things which we've been really focused on, just talk to, I want to talk to a couple of our examples, is we, we've been really uh, focused on supporting um, certainly whole of industries shift towards uh, more transparency and more connection with their consumers. Uh, and so to, just to, to indicate that pretty much any Australian prawn or shrimp, as it would be known in the US, that you purchase um, off a shelf here or anywhere in the world um, can be verified back to its fishery. Um, that matters because not all fisheries are equal. So we've got sustainable sort of MSC certified sustainable fisheries, for example, versus ones that aren't but also um, back to the farm of origin if it's a, um, if it's a farmed product. Um, this is a really, really big step because the seafood chain, there's plenty of stories out there about the level of food fraud that happens inside the seafood chain. Um, and, and I've been involved in work similar to that. Um, what's really exciting about this particular, um, particular group, the, the, um, the prawn industry here in Australia, is they've said, you know, we acknowledge that. But what we're going to do as a source of prawns or shrimp is we're going to send integrity up the chain. And now what we're seeing is some of the big retailers reach down and say, yeah, we're interested in that. That's then been supplemented by a fantastic program, um, which effectively is based around 
Um, one, it's a transparency strategy, sharing what's and all, what's going on inside the industry, but also storytelling, you know, giving consumers some information about where these um, prawns have come from. So I encourage anybody that is interested in this type of area to go and have a look at australianwildprawns.com.au, um, go through the videos, have a look um, at the way in which the, the, the content's been put together, but also just, just think more broadly about the strategy that's at play here. And it's about getting out there. This is who we are as an industry. This is what we're about. Um, and, 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 you know, saying to them, you can, you can trust us. You'll also find a video which features myself and um, my chief commercial officer, Grant, talking about the importance of where consumers are at and also the role that we're playing in this. Final slide, um, I just wanted to circle back um, to some of the other stuff we do. Uh, I mentioned eggs um, earlier today. We do a, whole, a reasonable amount around fresh produce. So, you know, provenance underpins our food safety system too. So um, being able to rapidly verify or identify where, for example, contaminated lettuce um, has come from enables a couple of things. One, for the, that particular source to be recalled accurately, but also it enables the rest of the lettuce producers, say in a region that maybe aren't subject to that, um, to be able to continue trading. Uh, coffee, for obvious reasons around ethical sourcing, but also we see a lot of single origin claims on coffee. Um, we routinely do work back to a uh, particular country, but also back to particular uh, coffee producers or cultivators. Uh, wine, um, one of our oldest services around back to region of origin mostly, but we can actually go back to a particular brand. Um, and then jumping out of food in, into jewellery, um, where we're routinely doing stuff around um, either blood or conflict diamonds um, and also smuggled gold um, out of um, the Congo. Uh, I think that pretty much wraps it up. Um, um, if, if you're looking for more information, you can obviously go and have a look at our website, but also, you know, follow me on LinkedIn too. We're obviously contributing a fair bit of content there um, as, as it comes about. Um, and there's a fair bit of discussion happening at the moment, obviously because of COVID-19 and everyone's working from home. So thanks very much. Great. Thank you so much, Cameron. Um, so your technology sounds fascinating. Uh, but you didn't, you didn't tell us how it works. Can you give us a, <laughs> a, a you know, a 20 second, yeah. you know, sure. overview of how it works and, you know, for us um, that do not have a forensic background? Sure, sure. Yeah. So um, what we, so it's, a, it's an actual lab based test is, is the first thing to say. And the reason why I say that is it's not a barcode and it's not a chip and it's not a data carrier. Um, what we do is we take the, the real sample um, and we determine um, its chemical, molecular and isotopic fingerprint. Uh, and we use that particular data um, effectively just like a, a human fingerprint um, to determine or verify where it's come from. So the first application for this for us, so I think the first publication was in 1979 or near about. There was some work just before it was actually around stolen gold. So, so taking stolen gold, um, determining its fingerprint and, and effectively mapping it um, back to where it's come from. Um, and it's based around a reasonably um, simple premise. And that's that pretty much everything that we touch, eat, consume or purchase um, will have a fingerprint, which will not only um, reflect where it's come from, but also how it's been produced. So, you know, I talked a little bit about um, eggs before. Um, so the fingerprint inside an egg, there's a very strong amount of that fingerprint is driven by where it's come from, but also the method of production affects it also. So that's why we've, we've built these quite complex, reasonably large data models around um, is it free range or is it cage? Um, or is it barn, for example, or whatever the system may be, however it's described in whichever country. Um, but that fingerprint is, is definitely influenced by that also. And so what you end up with is the capacity to take the real product um, and independently provide some information, um, which is outside of the packaging, outside of the label, outside of the data carrier, outside of all the other stuff which man puts on it. Right. Um, and it's, and it's that the challenge we have from an integrity perspective is that's the problem, right? It's whenever we start getting involved and putting the label on, that's where the challenge is. Okay. Yeah. Super interesting. Um, 
Now you mentioned, you know, transparency several times in your yeah. talk and, you know, with other, other folks that I've spoken with and, you know, transparency seems to be critically important for millennials. Um, yeah. Do you have any insight on why millennials are more passionate or driven by transparency than, than older generations? Uh, <laughs> there's lots of, I think there's lots of answers to that. It's a great question. I mean, I, I think firstly, I agree um, that they definitely seem to be. Um, and some of the consumer work we've done supports that. Uh, the other thing I'll say is that um, they haven't been through um, a period like we're seeing with COVID-19, which lots of our parents and our parents' parents saw with either very deep recessions or, or wartime, you know, if we can go back far enough. And so um, I, I'm really interested to see whether their perception or their, the, the, the value they place around transparency is either amplified or softened um, through this process because you know, to some extent, there's much, there's been a, there's constrained choice at the moment often. So, so maybe they don't have the power that they had before. So I think there's, there's the, I guess the, the backdrop. Um, in terms of answering the real question though, as to what's driving this, I, I think outside, outside of their phone um, or their mobile device, um, probably, you know, they, there isn't too much that's as important as that mobile device. And so um, they are super or, or almost hyper connected to each other, um, which means that, because in, information effectively is the lifeblood of transparency, right? So um, the capacity for that information to flow around that group is, is just extremely high compared to those other groups, right? So that's the first point, there's a practical bit. Outside of their phone, I think they do probably care about the impact they're having on the environment. Um, I, and I think that's also driven by um, information and, and their access to information. Um, and they're also incredibly tribal. So I think when you add the information, you add the, the, the drivers, um, and then you add the, the absolute dependence that they have on technology and their access to technology. And I think you see what this behavior is, um, which is definitely an expectation of transparency. It's one of the reasons why we argue that even if you don't know exactly what, what you need to share, you need to start sharing because the fact that you've actually started is, is probably the most important bit, um, especially for those millennials. And so if you go to one of those examples I used, um, the worst possible case that you can have is that you walk off the cliff um, from as a brand or as a business or as an industry um, and your social license is absolutely under threat and then you decide that you're going to be more transparent. Um, that is definitely not the strategy. And, and so you've got to try and get in front of it. Even if you don't know exactly, you want them when they look, when they, when you're walking off the cliff because something's happened, you want them looking and saying, well, actually these guys have been pretty open with us since the start. And, and maybe there's a chance of, you know, hitting a branch on the way down and slowing that, that fall or something, because yeah, I, I think that's the only way. And, and what we're finding is becoming quite non-negotiable. Um, and I think it's driven by that segment, but it's not just them. It's also mum, like parents as well. Um, you know, certainly parents of young kids, although lots of those would be sort of millennials too, but, but those guys are also pretty connected to where their food comes from and they have an expectation about that, that information. Okay, excellent. Um, you mentioned food fraud. You know, we work at Agritecture, we work mostly with uh, folks in the produce industry, um, can you give us, you know, we, we don't hear much about food fraud except for when, you know, something happens in the news and, you know, someone is exposed, but how, how rampant or how widespread is food fraud in, in the produce industry? If you have any, any knowledge of that. Yeah. And I, again, let's do the back the backdrop to the, or the background information to that question. Um, I mean, there's lots of numbers floating around about what the total value of food fraud is. I mean, I see these numbers, 50 billion globally and, you know, 80, you know, 20 plus percent of your supermarket purchase could be fraudulent and all of these sorts of things. I, you know, having been a practitioner in this space as long as I have, I think they're all made up numbers. Um, the, the, the basis or the foundational bit of information that I think is important here is that most fraudulent food 
um, or food that maybe um, isn't necessarily entirely what it's claimed to be is actually safe. Um, and so because it's safe, we very rarely hear or, or go and look around what some of those other claims are. So, you know, it basically gets purchased, it gets consumed, and we basically continue on with our, with our day. So, so because of that, I don't think we really know um, how much there is. Specifically around produce, um, yeah, sure. I mean, we, we've definitely done some stuff around um, lettuce, for example. Um, and there are a couple of things that can go on there. One of them is obviously one of the obvious ones is organic um, and claims around organic when they're just not. And, and obviously you guys would know pretty well, there is a premium associated with that. Um, there are also some bigger plays there too around, you know, you might be a food service business, um, which is buying large amounts of this lettuce. You've gone and um, you've gone and audited um, on site. One of those lettuce producers, that particular lettuce producer is a little short. Um, and so we'll suddenly take that lettuce from next door or maybe up the road, um, which, you know, on the surface doesn't seem like a big deal. But, but if that particular other source um, does have a contamination, um, then all of a sudden the substitution that's happened there becomes quite material. And so we do see a fair bit of that. We also see it around um, where you've got um, kind of distributed supply chains where you've got sources, maybe aggregators or people that are put, putting food together um, and then people purchasing. And so what you often see is um, more of those claims coming out the other end than what it, than what it, than what went in because obviously, you know, the guys in the middle are buying, you know, maybe one part organic and nine parts other, but what's coming out is five parts organic and five parts other. So, so even inside that, that chain you can, um, and then, you know, I mean, pro not necessarily produce, but you go into even commodity grains, you know, organic grain in particular, you know, or country washed grain, you know, where there might be particular, you know, free trade arrangements or, um, you know, specific levies or, or even bans in some cases. So you'll see grain flowing around the world that probably normally wouldn't and, and stuff. So, yeah, it, it's across all of them. Yeah, I remember in the news, um, I'm not sure how long ago, a year or so, about organic wheat or supposedly organic wheat, I think, large quantities. And, you know, there was some operation that was was selling supposedly organic wheat, but it wasn't. And anyhow, um, I guess, you know, wherever there's a wherever there's a buck to be made, people will try and take advantage of it. Yeah. And, and just to give you an indication of the size too, right? So, I mean, we tend to talk about, we tend to talk about crime inside the supply chain as opposed to more broadly or more specifically food fraud. But, but if you think about even some of your produce supply chains, right? But, but certainly those big commodity grain ones, um, the, the variation um, from even the top price to the median price um, across a year, um, that variation, there is an awful lot of stuff that can happen inside that variation um, in terms of criminal influence and criminal activity. Uh, if, you, if you build into the fact that you can add a premium in by making it organic, um, then all of a sudden the, the, the return on that is, is sometimes it's immense. Um, and so, yeah, so the scale of this is it, it could be enormous. And that's one of the reasons why I argue that I just don't think we know, you know, what the size of this problem is. And, and that's because, my, like I said, most of that stuff, most of that, you know, produce or grain or whatever is going to be safe. Um, and there's going to be no reason to go and look further. Sure, sure. Excellent. Well, Cameron, I'd like to thank you for your time today. It's been a pleasure having you on, on the show and been super interesting. Where can our, um, our listeners find out more uh, about your company? Yeah, so um, I think there's a couple of places. Um, I think I would check us out on LinkedIn. Um, so either via myself or via our, one of our showcase pages, but also um, feel free to go and have a look on the website, www.sourcecertain.com. Um, I would also encourage anybody that's seen the presentation to go and have a look at um, the Wild Prawns website um, as well, which, which I think is a really good demonstration of the type of output that you can get from a holistic transparency provenance strategy. Excellent. Okay. Well, once again, Cameron, thank you so much and um, stay safe in Australia. Yes. Thank you very much, David. And thanks everyone um, for listening along. Excellent. Excellent.